So we have been making much of a theological theme that God is with us. The central expression of Psalm 23 is, for you are with me. And the presence of God in our life is that which makes life life. And so it is still, though, an interesting concept to explore. I can think of a lot of Bible verses where God promises that he would be with us wherever we would go. Uh, Jesus would say in Matthew 28 that he would never leave us or forsake us. So there's the notion for the believer that Christ is with us. The psalmist understood that. We should understand that. But what does it really mean? What, is, what if I don't feel like I'm in the presence of the Lord? What if I have a terrible day and did I chase the presence of the Lord away from me? Do we have to take classes on how to enter in to the presence of God? So how do we really describe this and define this? What does it mean to be in God's presence? Is it sort of like a cool breeze on a hot day that you feel and it comforts you? Is it the fragrance after the rain, as one particular song put it? Please, please don't tell me it's like humidity that <laughs> just covers you and, you know, makes you feel yucky. Uh, is, is God's presence like a strong memory that you just, you're always holding on to it? I've heard people say many times, well, my dearly departed will always live in my heart. But do you really understand the presence of that departed one with you if they're in your heart? What are you really saying when you say that? And then what do we say when people say, I've invited Jesus into my heart? Is there any difference between those two expressions? Um... Is it, is it like a favorite daydream that you keep coming back to and it just makes you feel good? And it's something that's other than this world and you just sort of take yourself there? Is it like an addiction that it's just completely got a hold of you and you can't do anything but what that addiction tells you to do? Those of, those of us who have addictions... You know I'm addicted to soccer. I will die one day playing soccer. Uh, I think a lot about that. Is, that. is that what it means to be in the presence of God? Is like, I just always want to be and do and think. And... But it has to be in some other kind of category that's physical. And it has to be in another category that's just mental. There's this other category called spiritual. And how do you unpack the spiritual? In the Old Testament, we could see and sense with visions and audible signs that God's presence was there. There was a cloud. There was fire. There was thunder. There was earthquakes. We knew where God's presence was. When it was in the tent or in the tabernacle, I mean, you could sense it. We don't seem to have that kind of covenant agreement with God any longer, where he makes himself known in such a way. All of us have had those times where we thought, man, God was there, that was a miracle, that was important. But the continual sense that God is always with us, it seems to be something other than something physical. It must be something spiritual. Is there a connection with this idea of the soul we have a conscience, we have a, a connection with our Lord. So I wanted to once again look at an Old Testament passage and see how it was preparing us for a New Testament reality. And that Jesus in his many words that echo Jehovah God of the Old Testament, that he would always be with us, can be a reality for us in the person of Jesus Christ and certainly by the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. And in large measure, how coming to this table is a complete demonstration 
of God making his presence known to us. So if you would, please take your Bibles and turn to Exodus chapter 24, where we will read a section of it and see what it describes. And again, we had a sermon that looked at chapter 32 of Exodus and a complete fiasco of the golden calf and everything that broke loose from that day. And yet Moses would come back to God and say, we still need your presence. Even though God had judged them fiercely, Moses said, we can't go on if we don't have your presence. Well, we come back to chapter 24, where many scholars say chapter 24 is the highlight of the book of Exodus. It sits and is situated right there in the middle. Of course, you know what that means for some Jewish outlining techniques. What's in the middle is most important. And here in Exodus 24, you, you see basically a meeting with God as being the highlight. I thought the highlight was, Mo, uh, was Pharaoh being judged and washed away. I thought the highlight was the tabernacle and its instructions and its plans. But no, right here in Exodus 24, there's something very, very significant that takes place and some very interesting language that takes place that helps us to understand what we're doing when we come to this table. So Exodus chapter 24, we look at the very first verse. Now he, this is God, said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and worship from afar. So here, scholars recognize this opening of chapter 24 as the template for how we are to come into the presence of God in a way that he approves as acceptable and is worshipful of him. And it begins with a call to worship. We begin our services with a call to worship. God is calling us to himself. And uh, if you look on the back of your worship folder, you'll see how many times Moses was running up and down that hill called Sinai, that mountain, because God was always calling him up there. And it was only Moses. Maybe once in a while he'd have a companion with him, but that companion could only go so far. It was only Moses who could enter into the presence of the Lord. But here in verse 1 of chapter 24, there is a group of people who are asked to come into the presence of God on this mountain and to worship him. And that's the Hebrew word. They were bowing down. They were taking the posture of worship. It's interesting. We don't see it very much in our tradition, but I've been to several different churches that have the kneeling rail. <laughs> and you pop that down and you bow and they want you to take the position of worship and prayer and that you bow your face before the Lord. So some of this is being communicated here. And let's not let go of that number 70 because it was 70 of the descendants of, of Jacob that entered the land of Egypt and his family went to Goshen and they multiplied. That 70 was the seed of a, a nation that God was going to redeem. And interestingly enough, when Jesus has his ministry on his earth, and he's sending out his disciples on a campaign, he has an event where he sends out 70 uh, disciples to proclaim the good news of the kingdom and the advance of Christ's kingdom. So now we've got 70 of the elders and Two important high priests, sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, who I just can't stop thinking about what happens to them, but we, we move on. Verse 2, and Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but they shall not come near, nor shall the people go up with him. So again, this call of worship is very selective. Only one person has the right to come before the presence of the Lord. But as a matter of communicating favor and sanctification, the others will be further away and then others will be further away. 
This is something that's being communicated about who could come near to the Lord. You know that passage in the book of Hebrews? It says, draw near to the Lord and he will draw near to you. People couldn't just draw near to God. <laughs> He'd slap you down. How could the, the writer of Hebrews say, now you draw near unless something has changed in our relationship with God. Unless somehow you have become a priest and you have been called to worship before him. That's a gospel truth. Verse 3. So Moses came and told the people all the words that the Lord and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has said we will do. Oftentimes Moses was in the presence of the Lord and he was writing all the things that God wanted his special people to do to look like, the rules to live by, their worship, their morality, their justice, their righteousness, everything about their character. And Moses reads them a portion of what he's written, and the people say, we're going to do that. We're going to be that special people. So this is a very interesting aspect of this worship service that has begun. It is also accompanied with the public reading of God's word. Part of a worship service, the reason why we spend so much time reading through the scriptures is so that people hear the words of God. Because when I get up here, I probably will mess it up. But if I read to you directly from what God's word says, you're going to hear what God's word says. And also I want you to make connections to what we're covering on a particular Lord's Day. But Paul would even tell Timothy in, in uh, chapter 4, verse 13... He said to him, till I come, give attention to reading. And a lot of translations, I noticed, put the word public in there. Because that was supposed to be what he was communicating. I want you, when you are leading your churches, I want you to have public reading of the scriptures. To exhortation and to doctrine. We're to be committed to these things. And just like ancient Israel was hearing God's word, we as a church should also hear God's word read. Verse 4, and Moses wrote all the words of the Lord, and he rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. They were going to be represented before God. Verse 5, then he sent young men of the children of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. What is another aspect of worship? That we bring an offering to the Lord. And there's this portion in most of our services where we take the offering. And that's almost always associated with people giving their hard-earned cash to the church. But what is really happening there as an offering? What does it mean to bring a sacrifice to the Lord? Well, it acknowledges that we also have needs to be reconciled to God. And it, it also acknowledges that we're seeking to have peace with God. Now, it's very important how I describe what happens next, because we are not buying God off. And we're not trying to bribe Him into favor with us. There is something that has happened within us that means bringing an offering to him is an expression of our heart and our gratitude and what God is worth to us. You know that the word worship is built off of an old English word, worth-ship. What is God worth to you? Is, it, is God worth enough to you that you can get up early? For many of you, this is not early. <laughs> to get up on a Sunday morning, get dressed, and drive through town and go to a building where you're going to meet some very interesting people. Is God worth that much to you? Is it worth it to you to provide your income in a way that advances His Do you love His kingdom so much and you want to see it propelled and expanded on the earth that you happily donate your money to it? What kind of sacrifices do we make to communicate 
how much God is worth to us. It really shouldn't just be a couple hours on Sunday morning. It should be every day we're demonstrating what God is worth and the value that he is in our life. And if he has value in our life, then we will be reading his scriptures. We will be speaking of his power, might, and grace, and goodness, and all of his compassion, everything about his attributes and nature. We will be sharing it with our families. We will be training them up in the goodness of the Lord. What's it worth to you? And if it to you is like, oh, this is a dreary sacrifice I have to make, then you don't have a heart of gratitude or thanksgiving. I guess God hasn't done anything for you to, to make him lovely in your life. Well, these young men bring an offering to God. I don't know what was in their heart, but God wants a sacrifice. God wants a demonstration of connection to his people. And there's a way for us to express how pleased we are with God's redeeming love for us. Verse 6 of chapter 24. And Moses took half the blood and put it in basins. And half the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant, which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. Again, the theologians who study this passage say, what has Moses just done there? What has happened in this worship service? Well, he's consecrated them. He has set them apart for a new identity, for a new role in the world. They were now a sacred assembly, and he was devoting and dedicating the people to the holy service of God. Earlier in Exodus 19, verse 6, God said, Israel to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And now through this covenant service of shedding of blood and sprinkling it on the people, he's just declared them to be the priestly kingdom and the holy nation, a people that are pleasing to the Lord based on their confession, based on their profession, and God's sanctifying anointing. So let's talk about that blood. They killed a bunch of bulls, and they drained the blood, and they put it in basins. And half was thrown on the altars where the bulls were sacrificed. And what does this represent? Now, um, in the Old Testament, in the Law of Moses, some specific items of the worship tabernacle, the certain vessels, the altars, certainly the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant, blood was applied or sprinkled or smeared or anointed these items to ceremonially cleanse them. Right? To me, that just sounds a little gross. Blood doesn't sound to be like a cleansing agent if you... You know, it wouldn't be like a kitchen item. You'd just spray on your counters. But here, God is saying, I'm going to purify this item so that it can be appropriately used for worship when blood is placed on it. And it will have the term cleansed. This will now be cleansed for my use and can be used to worship me. This item here, because blood has been applied to it. And the blood of a proper sacrifice pleased and satisfied God. Remember reading some of those passages where God says, and it was a, a wonderful aroma in his nostrils. It was sacrifices that were pleasing to him. And the blood of proper sacrifices uh, brought God favor and satisfaction. And certainly his anger and wrath would be assuaged. Thirdly, if the blood placed on the altar, cleansed, and brought satisfaction, then if the blood was placed on you, what would that mean? If it cleansed and purified the altar, 
and it made it acceptable to God, and that blood was placed on you, a vessel of worship, that blood placed on you would make you acceptable and cleansed and a, a satisfying vessel of worship. So there was some connection between uniting what is acceptable and, and holy before God with this application of the blood. You could bring God glorifying worship because you had been designated as a proper vessel for worship. So what happens to the people who come to God on His terms, whom He deems holy and acceptable in His sight? What do we have here but true worship? We have, we have the experience of dwelling in God's presence. We've been called to worship. We've heard His word. We've been set apart, anointed, and sanctified. We are now brought into His presence. We read about this in verse 9. Then Moses went up, also Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel. Before they were told, you don't come up here, only Moses gets here. But now they went through a little worship service. And now, according to God, he finds them to be acceptable. Now they can come into God's place and into his face. And it says in verse 10, And they saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone, and it was like the very heavens in its clarity. But on the nobles, those speaking of the elders, or one Hebrew translation says, for those who were near, because they're now near God, uh, uh, the nobles of the children of Israel, he did not lay his hand. So they saw God, and they ate, and they drank. What does true worship look like? It looks like communion. They're in God's presence, and they're eating, and they're feasting in the presence of God. This God whom the people constantly told Moses, you go and approach him. We don't like him. He's too fierce and frightening. The lightning, the smoke, the earthquakes. You can only assume if people getting close to him that they would be beaten down. And the passage says, look, God didn't lay a hand on them, so something about them was acceptable. Something about them satisfied God that they could be in, in his presence. Because God had made the provision for them by the way of the blood. God had made provision for them because of the blood of the covenant, because of his words, because of the consecration that Moses performs. They could know that they would have peace with God. They could know what the psalmist said. You are with me, and I get to dwell in your house. So the food, where did that come from? It came from the sacrifices that they ate. Who was allowed to eat those sacrifices? Well, if you brought a peace offering, you and that priest would share in what was burned up on that altar, and you would... Partake. It was a demonstration of being at peace with God. And they are having a meal with God. But the question is, did they really see God? Did they really? They saw something. They only describe his feet and the reflection of the ground that appeared as a beautiful sky or a gem. And it seems that whatever appearance they had of God, it was because they were bowing down and they were looking up and they kind of saw the, across the ground that God's feet. Somehow we may have had what we call a theophany, a, a demonstration of the second person of the Trinity before his incarnation in their presence. But they saw something from their vantage point the real point is that they had a covenant meal with God, which was a sign and seal of God's promises to bless them with a view to their future inheritance. 
God was saying, everything that's in this law, we're going to make it come about. And all the blessings that come from this law, we're going to share in this together. We're going to have fellowship in this together. So we have in this meal of Exodus 24, in this worship service of Exodus 24, we see some parallels between that and the Lord's Supper that Jesus has in the Gospels and the supper provisions that Paul expresses in the letter to the Corinthians. We also have this table before us today, this table that has been <coughs> practiced by the early church since the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so what does this table represent to us today in light of the whole thread of what we read in Scripture? That God wants to be with His people. Of course, God doesn't want anything, but He shows and demonstrates that He is among His people when He comes to this table. We call it the spiritual presence of God. But yet there are physical elements here to help us apprehend what God has really done for us. And there's language used at this table to help us recall all of the Old Testament worship ceremonies, all the sacrifices, all the pilgrimages, all the feasts, and to bring it all to this table. And then at this table, we are lifted up into heaven. And we're brought in the presence of God. And there, Jesus Christ is our host, and he feeds us. So God is reminding us of his presence among his people at this table. He's also consecrating his saints. He does that through a covenant. He says, I have accepted you. I have an agreement with you now. And why does Jesus say at this table, this is the blood of the new covenant? Why does he take the very words from Exodus and say, now there's a new covenant that's been initiated. It's still being initiated by blood. And as we read from Hebrews chapter 9, it's the blood that Jesus, as the high priest and also the sacrifice, sheds for us so that we can be found acceptable in his presence. So we are at a view of seeing God. Those elders looked and they saw God. Imagine the apostles when they had this meal with Jesus. They saw God. Of course, there was that conversation about, show us the way, show us it. Have I not been with you this long that you don't know that the Father was with me? Connections, connections. And so in the same way as the people were united to that which was cleansed by the application of blood on themselves and the sprinkling of blood themselves, there were sensible signs that they were included in the favor of God. They apprehended earthly elements to apprehend spiritual realities. This is just little elements, but they speak volumes about their spiritual realities. And of course, they experienced communion and fellowship with God. He set them apart and sanctified them for the rest of the world to be a different people. This table sets us apart from the rest of the world and why we often say if you come to this table in a way that is unworthy, then you're, you're coming into a tussle with God. Because this is a table for those who want to be in communion with the Lord. And Jesus establishes by his last supper a new set of signs and seals that would overtake the Old Testament narrative and you would say, the language of the Old Testament now applies to what I am doing for a new Israel, a new people who, with whom I will covenant, I will shed my blood, I will declare them righteous and holy, and they will serve me as kings and priests forever. So we come to this meal where God demonstrated this in Exodus 24. And we recall that it is a pointing towards Christ. And this meal today helps us to point to what Christ will do for us in the future. Let us pray.